How's everybody doing? Good. Are you ready for a couple more of these? All right. Just as the presenter said, I came from Ukraine, and I came to Puerto Rico to get inspired. Now, I'd like to tell you my story, and I would like to start with a metaphor that inspires me. 500 years ago, before the age of exploration, the world was a dark place. People were afraid to venture away from their homes. They were afraid to go to the sea because the sea was full of sea monsters. But then a technology was invented. It was called the caravel. A small ship, people would get on it and sail away. This was a terrible technology. It constantly broke down. It sank. It ran the ground. Many people that got on the ship didn't make it home alive. But there were those that did not quit, and they sailed to the distant shores, and they got to, to discover islands and even continents. And because of their effort today, the world is becoming a familiar place we know. We have a map of the world. And today, for a mere $300, you can uh, sail the same way that Columbus sailed and call it a vacation. Today, again, we live in an age of the great exploration. The caravel has been discovered once more, except for this time it's called a sequencer. This is a terrible technology. If you work with it, you know what I'm talking about. It floods us with a lot of difficult data to understand. It breaks down. But there are those that dare to do this science. And because of their effort of putting together the maps of the living world, we know better and better our place in the history of life and our place in the universe. And because of their efforts, one day the universe will be a better place for us. So this technology, first used for human genome sequencing about 15 years ago, has fallen down in price, not by the score of 10, or a hundred, not by a thousand, but not even by 100,000, by a million times. To the point that a small place like University of Puerto Rico, or a small lab like mine, can now afford to build their own genetic map and explore the living world. The only question is, where are you gonna sail? So when I came to Puerto Rico seven years ago. I found a place to live not very far where Columbus landed 500 years before. Columbus came there and it was greeted by a, a group of Native Americans, but what's more important to this story is by, by, by a flock of emerald birds that were making a lot of noise in the trees. Well, 500 years later today, both the Indians and the parrots decimated. In fact, at some point, the parrots had to be moved to captivity uh, in order to save the species. Because of a valiant effort of the aviculturists, the numbers of parrots have been rising for the last 30 years. And now, from the 15 that they had in 1975, we already have 500. And many of them are being released to the wild. And some people claim they have seen it in the wild, uh, hiking in El Yunque, for example. The thing is, uh, there are other parrots uh, flying out there in El Yunque, uh, but I'll give you a secret, uh, how to tell a Puerto Rican parrot. 
Here's a Puerto Rican parrot on this picture. And tell me if there's anything unusual about this bird. Yes, there's an antenna attached to its neck. Not every Puerto Rican parrot has an antenna attached to its neck, uh, but if it does have an antenna attached to its neck, it is a Puerto Rican parrot. And if you see a parrot with an antenna, please do not remove the antenna. Okay, so when I came to Puerto Rico, I realized that sequencing a map of Puerto Rican parrot would be an obvious choice. Everybody loved the bird. Uh, it has a genome that's not very big, uh, so it'd be easy to map. And also by uh, building this map, I would help uh, the recovery effort. I would help the people that are uh, um, helping to restore the population of these birds. There's only one problem. The problem is, where do you get the money? At that time, the price of genome map like the Puerto Rican parrot was about $10,000. That's just outside of reach of what the University of Puerto Rico can give me. Well, I don't think they can give me more than $3,000 at the time. Well, I could have written a federal grant. And I did. One time, they told me there was too grandiose. On the second time, they said it was the worst grant they ever said, or read. Okay, I failed twice, three times. Then I went to a place, uh, to a consortium that already had money to sequence a lot of birds, and I convinced them to sequence a parrot. By the end of the telephone call, they said, we're gonna do a parrot for sure. It's just not your parrot. Well, that's great. So what am I gonna do now? I thought maybe I'll just go in the street uh, and ask people for money. Right, that's a very good idea, in fact. And I started thinking about that. And this is what happened. A student of mine uh, was, ha had his sister visiting from France. She was an artist. Uh, the only problem was that she didn't speak any Spanish or English, and there's just so many things you can do on the beach for three weeks. So he came to ask me if she could do something uh, meanwhile, so, you know, she, she could be occupied. And I said, well, she's an artist. Maybe she can paint a parrot. Okay, let's give her a chance. Two weeks later, she shows up with a painting. Right, that's exactly what I thought. <laughs> wow. I bet I can sell those for $100 a print, and you know, about 100 of them will make a parrot uh, uh, project. So we did exactly that. Uh, we went and s on the street, started knocking on doors, started talking to lawyers and doctors and businessmen and rich people. <laughs> you know, can you guys come to our uh, Art show, could you maybe buy some paintings? Yeah, yeah, we will come. Nobody came. Well, it's not true. The students came. About 200 of them. And each of one of them brought their lunch money with them. And they donated $1 or $3 or $5 at a time with a great art exhibit at the basement of biology building. Well, the parents came to, we sold a couple of paintings, and we put the money into this box, this paper box that I felt was filling up. And at the end of the night, I opened up the box, and I saw it filled with $1 bills. I made about $2,000. It was five times less than I expected, and I thought, I failed again. There's no way I can do five of these. You know, they already give me all their lunch money. What are they gonna give me now? The next day, I was flying to uh, see my collaborators at the National Cancer Institute, and they were working a lot of cancer genomes. And I was sitting in this meeting, and they were talking about sequencing 500 genomes of tumors, and I thought, what if we just sneak in a parrot? That, 
that's just a little bit. Just one lane, how much would it cost me? Um, a representative of a company, he says to me, for you, $2,000. And I had $2,000. <laughs> so that was great, I had my first data, but this is what I learned. I learned that I shouldn't give up, and I learned that I can make money by asking people. So, I said, maybe, maybe I could just make more money somehow. Like, uh, running a couple of more fundraisers. And I ran not one, not two, but three. The first one was organized in a restaurant called the Lazy Parrot in Rincon. My friends from Surfrider Foundation helped me organize it. And I had everybody there. I mean, the whole University of Puerto Rico students came there with their paintings, the parrots. Lots of people came. It rained, but people came, and we made another $2,000. And then, this happens. A student comes to me, and she says, I'm a modeling instructor. Can I help? And I said, are you thinking what I'm thinking? I'm gonna have a fashion show. <laughs> right? So I envisioned this thing with the models walking on the catwalk and people giving lots of money, and that's exactly what we did. Uh, we had this fashion show at the um, Museo de Vida Silvestre. Uh, we had models walking in beautiful dresses, uh, red and green and blue because there were the colors of political parties, right, um, <laughs> of Puerto Rican pair. Uh, and then just to be political correct, I also brought the male models uh, so nobody get offended. Well, and then we had another fundraiser at Casa Espana in Rincon. We also had children models. Well, anyway, uh, models came, their parents came, their cousins came, the grandmothers came, the distant relatives came, you know, Puerto Rico. <laughs> and it was a great family affair, and we had these boxes of money. All of a sudden, we making enough money to make a map. And this is not something that I would expect, because usually a genetic map is made by big universities, big centers, big corporations. And there we are, people in Rincon collecting money in a box and making a genetic map. Well, we published a paper in the International Journal of Giga Science, and the press had a blast with it. They called this the first community sponsored genome project, the first parrot that has been uh, sequenced. And that brought attention of the university. They said, wow, look at this. Making genetic maps is actually, you know, something very important. Well, everybody paying attention to it. So the university got on board. And in fact, we started thinking maybe, uh, maybe we can scale it up. Not just university, the private foundations, Toyota Foundation, and then uh, uh, United States Fish and Wildlife Service, and uh, other uh, donors, they brought us enough money, so we thought maybe, well, just maybe, we'll buy a sequencer. I remember that day, it was like Christmas. <laughs> I had my own caravel, and I can ship to the places nobody had gone before. My students were even more excited. Because with this sequencer, we organized the Caribbean Genome Center, that is now at the University of Puerto Rico in Mayaguez, where we train undergraduate students how to build genomic maps, training in genomics and bioinformatics. And in fact, we already got not one, not two, but three federal grants. Well, and this is 
what it is all about. You get them to be excited. Well, and we continue with this. We go out and now we are expanding our project. Well, there is a parrot in Dominican Republic. There is one in Jamaica. There is one in Cuba. And there is one in Mexico. So how do we call it? Of course, the parrots of the Caribbean. <laughs> so what have we learned here? Well, first of all, we learned that we live in the era of great discoveries. And second is that if you dare, you can do science anywhere. And the third is that failure can be a great motivator. And the fourth, that you should never give up. And should communicate, communicate, and communicate. And finally, that the great ideas can come from small places. And ideas can spread. How far? Well, just another day, a few uh, months ago, I was listening to a science radio. And there was this program coming out of Hong Kong. Hong Kong, all the way on the other side of the world. And they're doing this great project, community project, where they try to raise money to do a genome map of Bohemia. A Bohemia is this flower that they have on the Hong Kong flag. Well, I'm listening to this program, and uh, in the middle of the program, they ask the scientists, what has inspired them to do the Bohemia genome? And to my surprise, they said, we've heard about Puerto Rican Genome Project, and they wanted to do the same. <laughs> you should give them some money. That prompted the uh, CNCIPR, a great outlet for scientific uh, communication, to post this tweet. In the lack of funding, Puerto Rico science leads by inspiration. The least I can do for you, Puerto Rico, the least I can do.